Welcome to the Sage Women podcast, hosted by Melanie White and Dr. Nick Engerer. We have real conversations with real women, health professionals, and coaches who share stories about perimenopause, menopause, and a range of women's health issues. Please subscribe so you get the latest updates every fortnight. Welcome to the Sage Women podcast. It's Melanie here, and I'm very keen to introduce you to today's guest, Felicity Brazel, who's going to tell us all about, well, some of her menopause story and what that's created in her life. So Felicity, welcome, and thanks for being here today. Uh, Thanks. So excited to share with you. (laughs) Could you give us a little bit of backstory about who you are and that sort of stuff? Yeah, so Felicity, uh, I'm 56. I've had a really diverse background, Canberra, Melbourne, overseas, um, Sydney in between there, and all of this um, pretty interesting context for the story to come ahead. Um, Mostly worked with companies that one would consider top tier companies like Mm -hmm. consulting and if I've worked in universities the top universities um, within the public sector both in Victoria and also here in Canberra which is where I am again now mostly also in highly you know in jobs that require um you know, a lot of innovation, um, a lot of responsibility, a lot of stress, super exciting. But, you know, what we would consider work-life balance, interesting um, as well. And given my age, I've seen a lot of changes. So because of the attitude to, I suppose, women in the workplace, women's role in the workplace, um, and also the attitude to health in the workplace as well. And now I'm working, I've got my own business, which I may touch on later because it's actually come out of my experience with menopause. Oh, can't wait to dig into this, Felicity. And just off the back of what you were just saying, I'm, you mentioned that attitudes have changed and, and some other things have changed with regard to health. And I wonder if we could start there, if you could talk about what you have seen as a change in the workplace. be interesting yeah. to know. Yeah, I think certainly looking at the changes, say attitude to mental health, I think it's been a really big one, Um, understanding that that is in fact a part of a woman's a person's actually, so sorry, I've just got women on my mind. So <laughs> working with, but as, as the person's journey, um, that it, it is just like I've got a sore leg or I've got the flu, and gave me more of an understanding about that and how to work within that, and still really, you know, create that psychological safety for people within the workplace. Yes. So important. The other thing that I've seen is also that real focus more on the whole of the person mm-hmm. as relation to what is the job that actually needs to get done and really supporting a person and a team within an organisation to achieve, you know, what they need to do. And yeah. sometimes to have not only that that support within the organisation themselves, mm-hmm. but also being able to support, I think, well, support um, the people to go, but this is also, we can go so far. This is also your responsibility, you know, to, yeah, yeah. to do it as well. And that's also the challenge because does that person have access to the services that they need? And that's whether it's a physical illness or a mental illness, you know. So but that's what I've seen. That conversation has changed. Um, But then I think the change now is definitely coming into, you know, the conversation about menopause, Mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. It's definitely out there in the workplace um, and has ways to go. I think there's still many challenges. We've still got glass ceilings, still issues with, um, you know, the uh, women going off and having babies and then you throw off, you know, challenges of having your periods and impact there and then you throw on, you know, menopause. So there's a lot to consider. Yeah, and I suppose at one stage many years ago people didn't talk about their private lives or their health or their sexuality or any of those things. They were under the hood, not spoken about. Uh, But the reality is we are 
whole people with lives outside of work that intersect what we do at work. And so not talking about them doesn't really make sense. We kind of have to understand the impact of all of those other things on the way we perform at work, our relationships with people in our lives, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And certainly observing over the years when those conversations or I've been part of those conversations being able to be had, just seeing the value to the person and having those conversations and also when I've been able to have them too. What a difference that's made when you feel really heard and really understood. Yeah. It breaks down a lot of barriers, doesn't it? And I guess now I want to find a bit of find out a bit more about your menopause story, what you're happy to share. Because I guess leading into this part of the conversation, I'm thinking about the changes you've seen over time in the workplace and perhaps what your experience was like before, during and after those changes. So I'm looking yeah. forward to hearing hearing your story about menopause. Yeah. Um I came back to Canberra. Um, probably I was working in Melbourne, would have come back to Canberra in about 2015, 16. I would have formally come back here. And I was under a whole lot of personal stress myself. Um, then came back into family stress um, mm-hmm. and situation um, and then started, you know, and then was fortunate um, basically that I was able to easily get work here. Um, but then went in as my want is to do to go into quite um, high profile, high pressure roles. With all of that going on, and then with my father who had Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. um, and all of a sudden I kind of like, this can't be normal for me to break into tears at work. I've never done that before. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden I'm finding myself extremely emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, and moods kind of going up and down, but I just put it down to everything. You, know? you had a lot going on at the time, it sounds like. A lot going on, a lot going on. On reflection, now I know it was the start of my perimenopause because mm. like a lot of women I've spoken with, all of a sudden my periods started changing and I had ridiculously fantastic, regular, easy periods and that kind of started changing. Yeah. So. Then I went in and then my father died and then I went into another, you know, another couple of big roles. Mm. Um, I had injury actually as well. I broke my wrist in three places and then found out that I was already osteopenic and still Mm. pre, you know, still perimenopausal. So that gave me great concern about um, managing my bone health going, you know, postmenopausal um and then I my symptoms you know with work I got brain fog I got you know forgetfulness I got joint pains but so many things and I just knew it wasn't me but um thankfully I even though my mother had died by this stage, my eldest sister who had gone through menopause had also died by that stage. I didn't know anyone, I hadn't, didn't have anyone really close around me I could talk with, but I knew enough that it was probably perimenopause. Mm-hmm. So I went, thankfully, it was also pre COVID, kind of pre COVID, but also after that. Um, I found myself a menopause doctor, a specialist menopause doctor here in Canberra. It was actually after. Um, And then I went, you know, something's just not quite right. It was obviously a time I could go and see her. So I went and saw her. So not in the height of COVID, but being in Canberra, we had a different experience anyway. Mm -hmm. So she sent me for a test um, and an ultrasound of my endometrial lining and my ovaries and found something was there. So here I was going to her for, okay, let's see what's happening to find something on my ovary. And then within two weeks, um, my ovaries were out, thankfully not cancerous, and then went straight into menopause. And, and it was another lockdown time. Um, so I, it must have been a lot to deal with all at once. It was a lot going on. And, you know, work was crazy ass stressful. I still remember my menopause doctor goes, 
So consider reducing stress because I was also doing a master's in applied positive psychology at the time, yeah. um, you know, out of the University of Melbourne. And I went, oh. Consider reducing your stress. <laughs> How do you manage it? Oh, what's the story? Life's good. Um, so then I went postmenopausal, had no real support at all from the surgeon and their rooms, unfortunately, at all. Uh, my doctor was great, but really hard to get into. I went into, um, and then I have a history, my family history of breast cancer. So what's possible for me to have for hormone therapy? Um, so it was a real journey of having to go and advocate for myself. And I am that person who can. Yeah. Um, I was the one who had to go and, you know, ridiculously though it might seem, I have an oncologist, even though I've never had cancer, because I needed to go out and find out from her, can I have it, you know, yeah. um, estrogen? And if so, what can I have? And then be that person who takes it back mm -hmm. um, to my doctor. Um and the one thing that I really miss, not only was all of this happening during COVID, but it was also very few people in my life were going through it. So yeah. I had no one to actually be able to talk with. And yeah. I was doing a really high pressure job, my brain fog, my memory, anxiety levels, you know, it was just going through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what I was doing and taking, you know, because it was all around about that self-care. It yeah. was very hard to have self-care. And then I had injuries upon injuries. So, and then it was, you know, that impacted again on my own well-being with, and what I, I'm an emotional eater. So what is I eating and inability to exercise. Wow. So my first part of my post-menopause journey was not fun at all. Really? Um, <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm, I'm hearing that. It must have yeah. been there's a lot going on. You had a lot of severe symptoms by the sound of it and, and very little support at that sure. time. But my set couple of saving graces was I was doing my um I was doing my masters and from the very first day of my masters, I said I want to study as much as I can on well being and um of women through menopause. So yeah. pretty well, I'd already had a lot of, you know, evidence-based knowledge that I gained mm. for me so much so that I, and I was hearing things that people were telling me, I could already say yes or no, or, okay, that needs more information. So yeah. that was one of my saving graces. Mm. When you say it was one of your saving graces, how so? How was it a saving grace for you? Empowered by information. Mm. empowered by knowing what I was feeling mm. was normal. Yeah, right. Empowered by knowing and being now in contact with people out in the social world, like Amanda Thebe, who, you know, I was chatting with her from an um, academic perspective and going, you know, and just being able to say, you know, this and that. I'm reading the books and her books and other books. So knowing that it's normal. Finding that particularly the, you know, this is back from 20 on with 2020 onwards. So that whole so social media landscape in this space has changed significantly in that time, in this time. Mm -hmm. So really being able to go back and go, okay, no, they're great. They're the ones who have been there from the beginning in terms of this and, and being able to follow them. Um, gaining understanding too or um, about who are the what information to trust and what not to trust or what to question and how to question it. Just on that, it's a, it's a really good thing to think about because a lot of people are looking for information. And, I mean, it's the market research we did before setting up Sage Women's Health indicated that a lot of women are looking online for mm -hmm. information as a primary source. How do you decide what's good quality information and what's not is there an easy way or a couple of tips that you have I decide by is it evidence-based mm -hmm. so I always look for if someone makes a statement I always want to go where are you getting that statement from yeah so I I I I suppose there are certain things that I will not look at information if it says balancing hormones 
Mm-hmm. If it says um, Dutch saliva message, I will discount that because evidence shows that you can't do either of those. So, but there are things that you can certainly from, um, you can certainly, you know, diet certainly helps, you yeah. know, go through menopause, um, which is fantastic. And there's definitely a lot of research out there about that. Um, so they are the key. And I really look to when I look for that evidence. So I look and say, okay, if it's been researched, I look at what was the research like. Mm. So, is it a good quality research by which means is that has it been done by more than five people you know yeah. is it repeatable um has the findings been peer-reviewed so mm. i know that all sounds very academic and there is a reason for that because it's a scientific it's method body. and it's our body is amazing and it's scientific and i always look at that too within well-being science and well-being science is not wellness, so it's nothing medical. It's got nothing to do with diet, nutrition, etc. This is my definition. Well-being means, and the science of what is going to help us um, thrive, to feel good, do good in life, and what are the consequences of that? Mm-hmm. Um, so, what's the consequences of not having good well-being? And but also, how can we improve it? Um, so all of that and the studies I look at from that, again, are all evidence-based. No. Yeah, and it's interesting in this area of lifestyle behaviour change, lifestyle interventions, evidence-based ones, in some cases there isn't a lot of available research because there's no money in that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that that also makes it hard for us to determine whether something is a valid solution or opportunity because it may not have been subject to any sort of rigorous study. Yeah, and I think I absolutely agree with you in the study and I think, you know, with that and I think particularly in regards to the menopause space. Yeah. yeah. So let's, you know, let alone everything else, it's the menopause space because some of the some of the studies that I've done, the research I've actually done, particularly into messages that are coming around women and menopause, you know, menopausal women, and particularly as they're portrayed in self-help books, um, it kind of comes in terms of, well, you know, us women are often devalued, mm. you know, more so uh, the older that we get, you know, and we're already valued less, you know, particularly in more of a Western society that are very ageist cultures. Mm. Um, as we, you know, women are more, you know, valued less anyway than, um, girls or younger women and men. So it's a really challenging environment in order to know what's going to work for me. What's, you know, one is the evidence good, but then what's going to work for me? Can you actually, I look at it often in terms of saying, right, well, it's not in the menopausal space, but if this is what you're working on, maybe this may be something for you know for you to use yeah yeah very interesting it it's hard for us as individuals to know what the best thing to do is because of the limitations but then as you say figuring out what works for you maybe it is a bit of experimenting or finding those evidence-based methodologies or having a reliable healthcare practitioner to help you to guide you on that path and make those decisions Yeah, but I think this is why, which is, you know, taking me and leading me to where I'm in with my business now, which is, I well, I'll go with my experience first, is that I was very much reaching out to, I have a great doctor, but that's all that medical space, you know, and it's knowing it. But then what was my support that I needed? you know and I was actually creating it as I was studying all this you know the well-being interventions and way forward I was creating my own program to improve my own well-being Mm -hmm. during um during this time and that was great all based on evidence stuff but it was also very lonely to be supporting myself in doing that yeah 
Um, and it's also very challenging. So, and I think it's that difference when you have people who can be there and support you through it. Yeah. So, and the one thing that I really noticed and needed support, even though, you know, through psychologists and work support, et cetera, is just still going, feeling fragile during that time. Yeah. You know, and feeling out of control during that time. Because sometimes, you know, feeling really break, this is my experience. So it's like feeling really breakable, you know. Yeah, because, it's a very appropriate word. I felt that too myself. Yeah. And not knowing what was going to happen from day to day. Mm. Um, or from actually sometimes from moment to moment. I can say I made some great decisions when I was really narky due to hormonal <laughs> ups and downs. <laughs> Maybe a couple of challenging ones or questionable ones. Yeah. But the one thing for me is, which is what I want to, you know, give to women is, you know, helping them go and become anti-fragile. Mm. So it's also not be, you know, it's more than being resilient and it's more than bouncing back. It's actually helping them grow during this disruption, this time of challenge yeah. and disruption and change um and then really focusing on that which is the part of their life that's been the most disruptive and then how can we you know what can be done you know and what do they need to do their choice what's going to work with their lifestyle to help yeah. them improve that and get them through that point in time Mm -hmm. so um and it could be something really little I think as we always talk about and I the one percent you know yeah. the atomic habits what's a one percent change that I can make in order to you know maybe give you know um in order to make life just that little bit easier yeah it's absolutely the coaching ethos of the person is their own agent they're in charge of their own life and they just maybe need to think out loud and figure that out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that's it. I think what I wished for myself was a mentor. So mm -hmm. that's that's what I provide now is I provide mentoring through it. it. may not be, word may change, but I think mentoring is it. Just walking along with them and in that path because it's the, you know, they've got the answers, but it's also having that knowledge and that experience through it as well. Yeah. And I think, and I'd be curious to find out from you too, because, you know, with the women, um, it's, it's the starting point is having a really good knowledge of menopause in the first place. Yeah. And quite a few women that I've been in contact with don't. Mm. And some of that is because it's just never been spoken about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can't make change unless you know what the problem is and you can't understand the problem unless you have the knowledge. Yeah, and everyone's experience is so different. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you've probably spoken about it before, but all the research is, is that um, because of our demographics, our lifestyle, our biology, our, you know, the society in which we live in, our, you know, our psychological makeup and experiences, that all influences how we feel like how our body reacts during menopause both mm. at a psychological and a biological levels mm. so all the discomforts that we may feel um, and then I think that's also tricky because we may experience discomforts or symptoms but are they menopausal or not yeah you know, and how do you determine whether they are it or not and then you have the complexity too of you you know, if you have someone coming in from an, another country, let's say from Vietnam, who, um, you know, they might have a very different approach, cultural approach to menopause, yeah. Yeah. and then they come into Australia, then they often will start taking on the Australian cultural approach to menopause. Yeah. So, and do they know that and are they aware of it? And then it's, so which cultures in Australia talk about it or not when it's not really, you know, I think it's too often in Australia um, in the media when it's spoken about, it's still very white mainstream um, discussion about it rather than, you know, other ethnicities um, and then and also other cultural backgrounds and then also from a transgender perspective. So. Yeah. 
There's lots and lots of layers that make us all so unique in our experience of this. And of course, 20% of women have no symptoms, lucky them. But the 80% of us that do and have at least one very disruptive symptom, that's that's significant. And there are a lot of women out there who are struggling with menopause at some level. And Felicity, I'm keen to ask you, in terms of your experience with menopause going through it, What do you think the silver lining has been the biggest opportunity for you of having gone through menopause as you did? Um, Not having periods anymore. (laughs) Once I, though I missed it to a certain extent, and maybe that's because I had it via surgery. Um, I think I missed that monthly cycle for a period of time, I have to say, it was that familiarity of knowing how my body worked. Um, I love the fact now that I don't have that. So no, the, no, I mean, I still have, you know, postmenopausal, I still have a few ups and downs, but I don't have that to the extent. So whereas before I used to have to plan my month depending on what I was going to be doing. Um because of energy levels and just respecting my body in that sense. I love the fact of it's, it is that fact of refocusing on, I don't know, it's not refocusing, but it's like re it's going forward and go, who am I right here, right now? Mm. What's my life that I want to live right now? Um, I don't think it necessarily need, you know, it didn't necessarily need me to go through, you know, menopause to get to that point. I think I was naturally doing it through my masters anyway. Yeah. But it's that moment of going and saying, I'm, I, it's that I'm, I'm no longer transit. Well, I am transitioning into mm. a new phase of my life. Yeah, and I, I mean, I have people who are. 20 years younger than me going, I can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you're starting up a new business. I can't believe you're bringing in a a not-for-profit thing, you know, because they go, oh, my God, but you're 56. And I go, and? Because I don't feel it. Yeah, and why wouldn't I at 56? What's wrong with that? This is the societal norm or expectation for, for our age. Yeah, it is. And I think I've never lived within that. I feel great in my body. I feel, I feel empowered. And I think that's because I'm sure that that's because I'm postmenopausal. I'm absolutely sure it's though, it's also sure it's because I have more understanding now about my body and I have more understanding now about what's important to me in my life. So they're my silver linings. Amazing, amazing. And I think what you just described is something that I call the blank slate because all this this change is thrust upon you without your permission. And, you, you know, the first stage of change is understanding that something isn't right. And especially when it's outside of your control, then the opportunity is who who am I now and what am I capable of? And I love that you've really grabbed onto that and and run with it. Yeah. and. For me, I have because I work in the the supporting women through menopause or actually brought everyone through that menopause um, because I can't imagine not doing it. I can't be doing anything else. You know. I, I bet you couldn't have imagined yourself doing this 20 years ago. God, where was I 20? Excuse me. Where was I 20 years ago? No, I couldn't have. Yeah. I, the only constant in my life in that sense is I've always wanted to make whatever I touch better. So make the world a better place has been the one constant in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to tell us about your not-for-profit because I think that's really important and Mm -hmm. people listening to this might like to connect with you and get some support and understand themselves a bit better. So. I don't want to reveal at all, but can you tell us no, about that? No, not at all. So this is separate from my business. So my business is strong into superb, completely separate to it is Pop-Up Menopause Cafe. And Pop-Up Menopause Cafe is based on a UK charity 
um, in Perth, Scotland. 2017, they started. Oh. What it is are cafes, and I run two. I run a face-to-face one in Canberra, and I run an online one Zoom. So anyone anywhere can come along to it. Uh, what you do is you just, anyone can turn up. we just there to discuss menopause. Mm-hmm. That's it. You may have gone through it. You may be going through it, perimenopause. You may be postmenopause. You may be well postmenopause with no um, discomforts anymore. You might be someone who's interested just about. You may be someone who works with women who are, you know, are going through it, want to know more. You may be a kid of someone who is going through it and needs help, <laughs> maybe, depending on their mum's going. Um, a partner. And we literally just sit and we listen to the other story, you know, the stories of others' experiences. There are no experts. There are no talks. I have knowledge, obviously, but I don't go there with me. I go there and share my own personal experiences. Um, And we sit and we use the language I. This is what worked for me and this is what I'm feeling as opposed to, oh, how about you try X, Y, and Z? Mm-hmm. That really safe, confidential, nurturing space. Uh, so they happen, the face-to-face happens in Canberra on the first Saturday of every month and the online one happens on the first Tuesday of every month. Fantastic. I stalked you on Eventbrite and I see that you have your cafes listed there. So people, we will put the link to your contact details in the show notes. But also to know that if you go to Eventbrite and you look up Menopause Cafe, you will find you. Yes. I think you're the only one in Australia at the moment with Canberra and online. Yeah, I think so. The online ones, unfortunately, because of the way Eventbrite works, are actually via Zoom. But um, I've shared, um, I think you will share the Instagram. If you share Instagram and also Facebook and my um, the Menopause Cafe Canberra email address, um, then just send a link, um, you know, send me a message and I'll send you the links. The good one about the Zoom ones is that you can sign up for one or many all at the same time. So it makes it easier. I'm looking forward to jumping in myself to hear the stories because that's what it's all about. That's how we we come together for feeling not isolated, to feel part of something bigger than ourselves, to learn from each other. I think it's such an important thing that you're doing, Felicity. Yeah, thank you. And that's why I brought it in to Canberra. I, it's what I needed. And it's also what research shows we need. So it helps us through it. Thanks so much for taking time to chat with me today and to share your story and your insights. It's been really awesome. Thank you. It's been great. I always learn a lot from my reflections during this, so thank you. And, you know, we'll look forward to catching up with you on the Menopause Cafe. Yeah, look forward to seeing you. Thanks again, Felicity. (laughs) Thanks. Bye.